I get there and it's 80 degrees and I'm sweating and I'm ready to go. And I, I get to the front door and I realize I've forgotten my, my sample. Okay, good one, Rob. So I go back to the car and of course the car's locked and the car's still running. I was so nervous that I forgot to turn the car off. Podcasting from Boulder, Colorado. This is the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we dive into the story behind the story of today's most inspiring storytellers, creators, and entrepreneurs. I like big backstories, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Mark Gutman. I'm Mark Gutman, and on today's episode of Baby Got Backstory, how a 23-year-old waiter turned a simple idea into the best selling board game in the world. Now, if you like and enjoy the show, please take a minute or two to rate and review us over at iTunes. iTunes uses these as part of the algorithm that determines ratings on the Apple charts, and ratings help us to build an audience, which then helps us continue to produce this show. So go over there and give us a good rating if you think we deserve it. On today's episode, we are talking to Rob Angel the inventor of one of the world's most beloved board games and one of my all-time favorite board games, Pictionary. In 1985, using just a few simple tools, a Webster's paperback dictionary, a number two pencil, and a yellow legal pad, Rob created the phenomenally successful and iconic board game. He and his partners put together the first 1,000 games by hand in his tiny apartment And later, they ultimately sold the business to a major toy company in 2001. Rob's story is one of action, getting in and taking that first step, putting yourself in motion. It's a story of passion, optimism, and perseverance. I loved hearing how Rob took a simple idea and wouldn't accept anything other than becoming the biggest board game in the world. And this is his story. Rob, we're here to discuss how passion and persistence led you to inventing the world-renowned and iconic game Pictionary. Since we know where this story is headed, let's go back and start at the beginning. Did you dream of inventing a board game as a kid when you were growing up in British Columbia? What was little Rob like? (laughs) Uh... No, I don't think I was in uh, in the inventing mode. Uh, I was uh, curious. I was, uh, I thought, engaged, and I just had a curiosity about life. And I was always poking my head in places and seeing what was going on. Yeah, and, and what did that look like? What did life for you look like in British Columbia? Can you kind of paint the picture for us a little bit, and uh, maybe take kind of set the context too, like uh, with the time period and, and what's going on at that time? So yeah, uh, I grew up in uh, Spokane. Washington. And uh, I was really engaged. It was a really, really great neighborhood. We had about 25 kids and it was in a cul-de-sac. And so the, the upbringing was one of, of fun and communication and, and just really a great place to grow up, really great place to, uh, to feel belong, really. Yeah. And what took your family to Spokane? Uh, a job. <laughs> my, my father got offered a job and he had a fascination with Spokane. And so we settled there when I was about five, and uh, it just turned to be the, the best move for him and for the family, for sure. Yeah, and, w- and what did your father and your, and your mother do for a living? Dad was a salesman at heart and worked his way up to run Alaska Steel and Supply, which was a big scrap yard, but they had furniture and hardware and all kinds of things. And then my mom was a stay-at-home mom, but then she decided she wanted to work, so she sold real estate. Uh, worked at the local racetrack. So yeah, they both were uh, were go-getters. They both didn't sit around. Yeah. And so like when you were young, were you looking at them thinking, wow, I want to follow in my parents' footsteps or did you have a different dream as a youngster? <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's funny hindsight. When you look back and you're asking these questions, I went back and and looked at it. So there was a there was a story when I was about 12 years old and I had to go to Kimberly, or excuse me, to Calgary, Alberta for Passover to see my aunt and uncle. But I was on this bus 
And it was a terrible, terrible ride. It was, you know, it smelled and the, the bathroom backed up. And all I could think about when I got up there was I have to do this again when I get back. And so when I got back in the mind of a 12 year old, it was, you know, dad, I'm going to be so rich one day. I'm going to, I'm going to buy a bus and drive it off a cliff. Well, I think really what I was saying to myself was I'm going to drive my own bus. I'm going to be in charge of my life. Uh, and, and that is what I was looking for, the freedom to be in charge. And that was driving. That was the driving force between everything I did. Yeah. And, and, and I can really relate and understand, you know, where you're coming from with that, that urge and that, that desire to be free and to drive your own bus. But at 12 years old, I'm guessing <laughs> you probably didn't start driving your own bus either literally or metaphorically oh, uh, right yeah. then. Yeah, no, like I said, I'm, this is all retrospect and hindsight because I've told that story and I remember that story and it, it was a little uh, precursor foreshadowing, I think, without me knowing it at the time. Yeah. And so Spokane at that time, man, I've been to Spokane today and it's not like what I would consider a really big town. So uh, <laughs> at, at that time, it, it, it must have been a, a really small local town. I mean, what were you involved in as a, as a young boy in school? I mean, were, did you have favorite subjects? Were you into certain activities? Yeah, I, I enjoyed history and I enjoyed math. I was, I was, I have to be honest, not a very good student. The whole book learning thing went past me, but uh, I did assimilate the information and I really enjoyed the reading. And the one thing I really got into was pole vaulting. That was my sport. And I was a championship pole vaulter, which um, required a lot of discipline, a lot of practice. Uh, and that kind of set me up to, uh, to figure out how to you know, get things done that I wanted to accomplish. Yeah. And were you pole vaulting in high school or, or college or both? Yeah, I was, I was in college and uh, I really enjoyed it. I mean, you, you went fast and uh, yeah, I, I wound up in my butt a few times. You know, you don't get the, the leg up and all of a sudden the pole doesn't go the right way and you're, you're back on your back, but that was okay. So, <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, I mean, it was just part of the process, right? It was just part of what happened. No, it was a few bumps and bruises, but for the most part, I, I managed to get in the pit. Yeah. And so when you, when you kind of look back at that time, do you remember, do you have a first memory of your first game or your first board game uh, that, that really uh, caught your attention? Yeah. The one, the one I always go back to is risk. Uh, the neighborhood was really tight. So during this winter months, when the snow would pile up, we'd all get together and play games in one of the neighborhood's houses. And I just always loved playing risk. It was that uh, that world domination, I guess, that, that really resonated with me. And I just love that game. Yeah. And, and, and for our audience and people that, that might have forgotten or weren't, weren't alive then, gaming had a very different meaning and connotation and experience than it may, uh, many people may associate with it today, right? I mean, like, like board games were, were something that, uh, were high fidelity and were rich in experience relative to the time. And can you kind of set the stage a little bit about, how just important those types of games were to your upbringing? Oh, it, it was really important. Uh, it was the center of everything during those months. Uh, as you say, video games were a solitary endeavor. But when you get four, five, ten kids huddled around this game board, the, the camaraderie and the, and the fun and just the, the Fun, really. There wasn't anything dramatic. It was just fun to do that. And so it, it created a sense of, of family. And, and this connection that we had with each other just lasted for years. And yeah, it was a different vibe. It was a different, uh, a different mindset. But everybody played board games, Risk, Clue, Monopoly, and eventually Trivial Pursuit, and then Pictionary. But, but back then, yeah, board games were, were quite, uh, quite the hub. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you're playing games. You're, you know, just like every other kid who's, who's invested in, in that escapism and that entertainment. And, uh, you're going to, you know, we'll move into high school and college. And what did you think you were going to do with your life at that point? When I got to college, um, or before college, I worked for my father during my summers since I was in eighth grade every summer. And I saw, him, you know, be the boss. And I, I liked how people were watching him and he was in charge and he was a businessman. 
And so like a lot of kids, I just wanted to be my dad. So I, I went to school with the idea of being a businessman. I didn't know what that meant, but just the thought of that was what uh, I thought I was going to do. Yeah. What'd you think it meant at that time? I have no idea. Right. I like the only vision, my voice just went up. The only, the only, you know, vision I had was of my father. And so that was my world. That was my vision of what a businessman was without really knowing the details. And so I put my mind to go to school to be a business major. Didn't have a discipline, didn't at the point when I went at 18 years old. Uh, I didn't have a discipline picked out, but I thought I'd figure it out. Well, um, ultimately, in short order, the decision was made for me. And, and how was that? Yeah. Um, I get to college. I get to school. And mom and dad are paying for college, as you know, was, was the thing. Except halfway through my freshman year, my father got fired. And it was like, holy crap. You know, here, he, here he is, the president of this company. And all of a sudden, he's out of a job. And it was like, uh, now what? Everything I planned for, everything that I was looking up to was now gone. And I was had to figure out not only how to pay for college on my own, but I had to figure out what I wanted to do. Because if because I'm looking at him and remembering that bus drive, because if somebody else is in control of his life, his job, his future, that didn't work for me. I had to be in charge. So at that moment, I made the switch from businessman to entrepreneur. To, I'm going to be in charge of my life and not let anybody else dictate my terms. And so what's that switch look like? I mean, what do you mean you switch to an entrepreneur? Well, I started taking classes, as I call them, without yes or no answers. I wanted to just explore and experiment with, with, with business or whatever was going on. And so uh, I just started to expand my mind with the, with the idea that I was going to start my own business, find something to do on my own. So I gravitated toward those classes rather than, you know, accounting or, or the like. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because now this idea of being an entrepreneur is really celebrated. We actually have celebrity entrepreneurs, but back then, you know, when I, when I went to college, being an entrepreneur wasn't necessarily like a thing. And it wasn't something that was necessarily cool. It was kind of like what you did if you couldn't get a job. <laughs> that is exactly right. You know, you put on your resume, entrepreneur. What does that mean? You know, we're talking 1981. There was no entrepreneurial degree. In fact, I probably didn't know what the word meant. Uh, I'm just articulating it now. So yeah, it, was, it wasn't something that people strive for. They just were. Then this label that everybody was going to be one kind of came out and it made it, it legitimized it a little bit. But yeah. I was over there. <laughs> and so before it's legitimatized, like what did your parents think of this? I mean, were they concerned for your your path and your future at this time? No. Uh, they always were supportive of what I wanted to do. Uh, and keep in mind again by the you know, second year I'm paying for college on my own. But they uh managed to put myself through, but they were always supportive of me and my family and my siblings, whatever we wanted to do was okay with them. As long as we took care of our responsibilities, they were good. Yeah. And I, I believe you, you went to Western Washington university. Is that correct? Yeah. Western Washington up in Bellingham, Washington. Great. So you're, you're here at Western Washington. You're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and you put yourself through college and you come out. And I just have to imagine that you're an immediate, uh, huge success. You probably have to get a huge job or buy a huge business and away you go. Right. Uh, you obviously didn't read my bio. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or I did. <laughs> or you did clearly. Yeah. No, that didn't quite work out that way. I decided to hitchhike through Europe for five months after I graduated. So that just seemed like a nice reward that I wanted to do. So I worked for a year waiting tables and then I went to Europe. But yeah, something, something happened in the interim as we're, we'll discuss. But yeah, it was, it was, that was my media goal. Okay. So you go to Europe, uh, like most, mo most kids around that age do, but you're waiting tables and what's going on with that? What's, what's happening with, 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 with your life at that point? Well, I, I just graduated from school and waiting tables is how I put myself through school. And, and that was for me, 
at that moment, the ultimate freedom. Remember, I've always said, and I've always lived, freedom to do what I want, when I want, and how I want to do it is always important. So if I wanted more money, I would just work more hours. If I wanted to take time off, I'd just get somebody to cover my shift. But I was still with always the backdrop of wanting to do my own thing. It was always with the backdrop of, I want to start my own business, create my own product. And so that was always uh, forefront. And so I moved in when I graduated with three buddies. And we all were waiting, waiting tables or restaurant work or whatever. And we get home late. And then one day, one of my roommates says, hey, you want to play a game? Uh, sure. What is it? We called it charades on paper. We sketch words out of the dictionary. Okay. You know, I mean, it was like one of those, you're looking, I was always looking for an opportunity, but at that moment, the only opportunity I saw in front of me was fun. I mean, I wasn't thinking of a business. I wasn't thinking of anything like that. And we started playing. And lo and behold, we're up all night playing this silly game. I mean, it was just a blast. And then after several nights in a row, that's when it started, you know, percolating a little bit. I go, wait a minute, this might make a good board game. So all those board games I played as a kid and wanting to be an entrepreneur, all of a sudden are kind of crashing together to, uh, to form a plan in my head. Yeah. And what's your roommate's name? And had that game been played before? Or was it really like, uh, ge- was the Genesis right at that moment, like a crazy idea? That was something he played with friends at uh, Washington State University. Yeah, he was, it was a game they played and it was just an activity. There was no game. It was draw a word, sketch a word. And if you get the word right, you get a high five and a sip of your beer and off you go. <laughs> All right. So you're playing the game. And uh, do you remember that, that, first, that first night you played and what, what that was like? I remember more of the feeling of it. Because I just remember, you know, it reminded me of home. It was, and, and Rob was his name. He was one of the kids I grew up with. He was one of the kids I played games with. So it was an immediate sense of feeling home when we started playing together. And uh, it was just a very comfortable shoe to put on. Yeah. And so, you know, to say like, hey, I have this idea and I want to do something and I'm going to, you know, go build a game. I mean, people say that all the time, you know, sure. and, and I think that, um, you know, I think that's a real kind of misconception about entrepreneurs and building a business. I think, hey, like if I say it enough, it'll happen. But you actually have to like do something. So like, what did you do with this epiphany? Did you run out and build the game? Did you sit on it for a while? I did nothing. I went, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. You've got to take steps. And I was not ready, willing, or able to do that. So I went to Europe, but the idea never left my mind. It was always in my head to do this. So when I got back, the one thing that, that I couldn't shake is that I just kept kind of telling myself that, you know, I was just a waiter and I didn't have the skills. So I kind of just didn't do much with it for a little while. I had to get out of that mindset. And the other problem was the physical issue of how do I make a game, right? I have no idea. There's no internet. I don't know how to physically put a game together. I don't know about all the moving parts. And every time I started thinking about all the parts, I kind of I kind of shut down. And so I had to get past that. And, and I, I did when one day my mom sends me Trivial Pursuit. The biggest problem I had with physically putting the game together was how do I put words into a game? That, that is the physical thing I knew people were going were gonna to need. And so I, I, until I figured that out, I was kind of stuck. Well, mom sends me Trivial Pursuit. I open it up. And as we know, there were six questions on the card. And the first question, I read it, and I turn it over, and the answer is polar bear. And I, I look at polar bear. I just, you know how you, you know how you, you have this, this feeling that something magical has just happened. I mean, it was like, oh, okay, now wait a minute. I'm thinking, what something's going on here, and all of a sudden it hit me like a ton of bricks. This this aha moment that I'll put Pictionary words on cards and make the game that way. I mean, it was like it was like magic. My roommates thought I was crazy. I'm like, I'm like yelling that this is it. And it was really, a really a powerful moment. 
yeah, and it seems so obvious today, but like at the time, what was kind of like, what was the obstacle? I mean, like what other options were you thinking about in terms of like how to package this game? Oh, uh, I overthought everything. You know, I had not put a game together, so I was thinking all these things. So the, the major obstacle to getting started started was me. I was the problem. Couldn't get out of my head. I overthought everything, all the steps necessary to get it out there. And so while, as you say, it seemed obvious now that uh, that word list, excuse me, the, the card, but that was the catalyst to getting out of my head. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you brought up like the year is 1985. There is no internet. There's not this idea like, Hey, I'm going to go out on social media and tell everybody about it. There's not e-commerce. I'm just going to buy, go to the traffic store and buy traffic and pump customers. So you're, you know, and and there's, and you know, and a lot of times we, we don't realize what's possible until we see or hear someone else do it. So you don't have that, that magic of the internet where we can always go, Oh, this person in Africa did this. We can do it too. Um, you know, the world is so small now. So it's 1985. You have this epiphany. I'm going to put the game on cards. And then what happens? So I had to break it down because once I saw that, I had to break down the task of creating picture. I couldn't spend my time building a business plan and learning marketing and all these other things. So I literally broke it down to its easiest step, which as we just said, were the words. So I took a pad of paper, a pencil, and a little Merriam-Webster dictionary went in the backyard. And I'm sitting there and I open it up and I write down the first word that makes sense to put into Pictionary. And the word was aardvark. How was that? Aardvark. So I write the word aardvark down. And I literally, you know, flop sweats. I started, I started breathing heavy. It was like, I just wrote a word. I had just gotten started. And really what was going through my head was I'm no longer a waiter. I'm a game inventor. That's all it was. It was a mindset. It was a label that I put on myself. And I embraced it. I was a game inventor. And so as soon as I did that switch, as soon as it flipped, I went on to the second word and the third and the fourth. And from there is when everything just happened and everything built. It was from taking that one small, easiest first step. It's, it's kind of like people now, the first easiest step is like getting a domain name on GoDaddy. It's like nine bucks. So whatever it is, that just puts it real, right? Writing that first word made everything real. It was no longer just an idea rattling around in my head. That's all it took. Yeah, and what was so great about the word aardvark? Why is that such the perfect (laughs) Pictionary word? I had two criteria. I didn't want to overthink this process of creating words. Didn't want to get in my own way. So if I knew what the word meant and it conjured up a picture in my mind, you know, whether it was hard or easy, didn't matter. I wrote it down. And I didn't self-edit. I just kept going. And the first word, double A, aardvark. Yeah. And you talk now today when you're out talking with other entrepreneurs and talking with other people about finding their aardvark. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means a couple of things, but it mostly means just taking a first small step. Now, how you get there is also part of the process. Nobody really knows. I did not know that I would be inventing a game. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know what? I think I'll invent a game and here I go. Most people don't really know what it is they want. But, but I think most of us know what we don't want. I think it's easier for most people, myself included, to get rid of things so we can find out what we want. It's like uh, I, I tell the, the, the analogy of a, a wine sommelier. He can smell a glass of wine and he can tell you in 90 seconds what it is from any vintage anywhere in the world. And how do you do that? He says, I go, do you memorize every wine in the world? He says, no, I have no idea, but I know what it's not. That gets me to what it is. I know it's not a Merlot. I throw those out. It's not a Cabernet. And he just narrows it down to what it is. And that's what he finds his purpose. That's what he finds out what that wine is. And so finding your aardvark is going down a lot of different paths getting a lot of knowledge, 
things that, that aren't in your norm to see what resonates. So the more you explore, experience, the more you explore, the more you're curious, the more you'll find and easier it is to find your aardvark, your first step. Yeah. And, and thanks for that. And you have, all, you have, you know, the benefit of perspective today. So now you know what, you know, the aardvark <laughs> meant to you. And right. uh, thank you for sharing that. And it, it's really sound uh, experience uh, share for, for all the listeners as well. But you're, you're sitting there, you just wrote down aardvark, you're writing some other names. What happened there? I mean, did you, did you, did you incorporate a business? Do you have a storefront? Like w- what's going on with this, with this uh, idea? I like to say that I'm the uh, smartest guy in the room because I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I I know my limitations and I embrace what I know and what I'm good at. And I knew that I had to find partners to fill in not only the holes of what I didn't know, but also were in line with my mindset, with my vision. It's not just finding pieces of a puzzle. It's finding mental, spiritual, emotional pieces of the puzzle as well. And I knew that Pictionary for it to be successful had to look good. This was pre-internet. This wasn't me to be able to go online and find a graphics design firm. So I, one of the first partners I found was a graphic artist that I worked with. He was going to design the game. That was a very key. You're not going to want to pick up the game. I'm not going to sell it. The other partner was somebody to run the business. Terry Langston. I know I could, but I just didn't want to run the business. So I found a partner that had that skill set. And so I put together this team of amazing people that had different skill sets, but the same mentality of making Pictionary a success. Well, and so how did that pitch go down? You know, were you like, (laughs) hey, I'm going to cut you in, but I need you to work for free? Like, I mean, what's going on at that time? Or, or has there been a little bit of runway established before you went out and got those folks? Oh, no, there's, they both were after I started doing play tests. So once I developed the game, I had really bad graphics, uh, but we, I did some play tests. So I said, hey, look, here's the idea. Here's the game. I need this, this, and this. What do you think? I'm really, I offered them a little piece of the company without... Because I had no money. I think I think I offered actually to, uh, Gary, the graphic artist, offered him two thousand bucks or a piece of the company. I had forty six bucks in the bank, so if, if he had have taken the money, I would have been in trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he took the piece of the company, and so yeah, so it was it was literally just saying, "Hey, here I am." And I did ask one gentleman, a friend of mine, to join with basically the same sales pitch. Hey, I, I got this great game. It's fun. What do you think? You want to come on board? Can't pay you. And he said no, which was fine, which actually turned into really to my advantage. And so uh, they just instantly got what I was trying to do. I mean, it wasn't, hey, I need an accountant. It was, hey, I need a partner in this business. What do you think? And after a very short conversation, they both agreed. This episode brought to you by Wild Story. Wait, isn't that your company? It is. And without the generous support of Wild Story, this show would not be possible. A brand isn't a logo or a tagline or even your product. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or company. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. Wild Story helps progressive founders and savvy marketers build purpose-driven brands that connect their business goals with the customers they want to serve so that both the business and the customer needs are met. This results in crazy, happy, loyal customers that purchase again and again, and this is great for business. If that sounds like something you and your team might want to learn more about, reach out at www.wildstory.com and we'd be happy to tell you more. Now back to our show. And so what are play tests? Can you, can you give us a little insight into what that looks like? Yeah, we had to physically play the game to see if it was any good, to change the rules, to find out what worked, to find out what didn't work. Maybe the words weren't right. Maybe this rule didn't work. And so every time we would play, we would take notes 
and and change the rules. And we thought, actually, we thought when we first produced the game, we thought we had the rules just perfect. Uh, we didn't. We had to change them four more times after four production runs. So we were we were we didn't quite get it right, but we were willing to adapt and listen to our client, our customers and 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 change it if it made sense. And it did four different times. Yeah, and what were some of those early mistakes or, or rule changes that uh, you thought were, were perfect at the time, but uh, uh, you know we might recognize as, as changes to the game? Uh, <laughs> I, it made perfect sense to me that unless you guess a word right, you don't roll the dice. We could not get people to understand that. So if somebody didn't get a word, the other team just automatically rolled. And so uh, we had to change the verbiage over and over until finally people understood they weren't supposed to draw, excuse me, roll the dice until they got guessed the word right. Uh, people didn't understand the all play triangle. So we had to beef that one up, get that one to uh, more explanation. So when did you sell your very first game? And, and by the way, was it called Pictionary from the start? Where did that name come from? It was the three gentlemen that I played with after college. One of them, uh, we were playing and we used to look in the dictionary for words and he's looking up a word and all of a sudden he starts playing this old game that he played as a kid called Fictionary, which ultimately became Balderdash, which uh, actually Laura Robinson created that and is a good friend of mine now. And it was a bluffing game and he just said, well, I'm playing Fictionary and he kind of looks as, you know, pictures, dictionary, why don't we call this Fictionary? Okay, that was it resonated there wasn't any you know point in continuing the conversation it was perfect yeah when it's right it's right so when you know <laughs> yeah you know. i was like i was like yeah okay fine move on that was great. perfect so so pictionary day one what do you remember that first sale what what was that like and, and who did you sell it to <laughs> uh of course i remember that first sale it was to the university of washington bookstore and i'd never made a sales call before and so I get there and it's 80 degrees and I'm sweating and I'm ready to go. And I, I get to the front door and I realize I've forgotten my travel sample, my sample. Okay. Good one, Rob. So I go back to the car and of course the car's locked and the car's still running. I was so nervous that I forgot to turn the car off. So I'm standing there and I'm beating on this old beater car of mine. And finally get the back door open. And I I go up to this woman and we go in and I'm thinking I'm going to be in this big office, my vision, my vision board of what this first sale was going to be. And we wind up on the perfume counter. And I'm like swooning and the smells are getting to me. And I'm thinking, what the, you know what? And then I started, thinking, why am I on a perfume counter? This is, this is a bookstore. They're selling perfume. And I look around, they're selling mugs. They're selling all kinds of different things. Now this is starting to go, okay, I got to file this away. There's, some, there's something here. And ultimately, she starts asking me all these questions about advertising allowance, about shipping allowance. I have no idea what she means. But I, you know, I, I trusted her to, to give me the correct information. She filled out the form. I didn't even know how to do that. Hands it to me. She goes, okay, send me the six games. That was it. And I walked out my first sale. Yeah. And so I imagine you're playing it cool and, and like you've been there before and you get the order and, and your hands probably shaking and you walk out the door. And what does that feel like? <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was, it was validation for all the work that we'd put together. My partners and I was, it was validation that somebody wanted to buy this darn thing. We've been selling it to our friends and family, which is great we made retail at the, on that. But, but to have somebody take six games was just an overwhelmingly positive, cool feeling. I, I, couldn't, stop, I couldn't stop smiling. It, it was like, okay, we're on the way. It was like, it was like the aardvark, right? That was the new aardvark, was that first sale. It was an amazing feeling. I can only imagine. And so you're on your way, you're feeling validated, but and not to burst your bubble, it's only six games. Oh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, we, we only had a thousand to sell. And, and there were times when 
I would stand, we can talk about it, uh, at an escalator trying to market Pictionary for seven or eight hours. And I'd sell two games. I was ecstatic, right? It's six games. It's two games. Well, that's six more games than I sold yesterday. It was an exciting, exciting time. Those little numbers were really important because that's six more games in somebody's hands that didn't have them yesterday. It's six more games that people are playing. So we were playing for the long haul. We didn't, if we had sold a million games out of the box, probably would have never continued. But by selling six games, it was so important, so liberating to make us, make us go forward harder and faster. Yeah. And, and you're playing for the long haul, which I assume means you're probably not making a ton of money at this point. So what are you doing for money at this time just to get by? And like, how are you keeping your spirits up and staying so positive? Like at, at any point, did you think this, this isn't going to happen? Oh my, yes. There's plenty of times. I was still waiting tables. My Gary, my partner was still working Alaska Airline Magazine and Terry was a controller for a company. Yeah. We, we were living on $500 a month. I was still beating a beat up car. Uh, but, but it were just so much fun, the not knowing what was going to happen one day to the next. Yeah. There was, there was times throughout this whole process where I, I won't say I wanted to quit, but I will say it just became daunting and overwhelming. But what drove me through, got me through was passion get you started. It's like the igniter, but passion fades. And there were days when my passion faded. There was times it was just too much. But by, by going through that, I started to love what I was doing. I loved my product. I loved my partners. I loved what we were trying to accomplish. And that's what kept me going. And that was it. It was, it was this vision that we had that just kept pushing and pushing. It, was just, it just got me out of those moments where I said, you know, I'm just going to stay in bed today and not worry about it. Yeah. And so starting in 1985, when you, you know, put that first batch of games together, uh, and that first run was a uh, thousand games that were put together by hand in your apartment. How long did that take? And then, and then what was the next step after you sold a thousand games? We uh, put the games together, as you say, by hand. Uh, that took about 14 months from the day I said, okay, let's do this. And we had a few uh, problems like collating of cards and there was no internet. So we couldn't uh, give our specs to a company and say, here are our specs, produce a game. We had nine different companies supplying parts and they were all shipped to my tiny 900 square foot apartment. And we hand assembled the first thousand game. So that was, uh, uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Actually it was. Uh, so now we have a thousand games. Well, now, I have to sell them. We have to market them. And that's when the fun, that's when the fun really started. Yeah. And so and maybe I mis misunderstood. I, it sounded to me like you were doing most of that selling and marketing, uh, in person, knocking on doors. Uh, how else did you, did you move those thousand games? Well, my, yeah, we did the thou first thousand games, uh, in Seattle. And then we wound up ordering more and did those in Seattle as well, kept it local, very important for our growth. Uh, I would literally take the game based on this experience I had at the university bookstore, realizing, huh, if anybody sells anything, they might as well sell a picture. So I went to real estate companies. Why not? I went to pharmacies. I went to bookstores. I went to department stores. Anybody that sold anything, I figured they might as well be selling Pictionary. And what that did for us was... People that normally wouldn't see a game saw a picture. People would go into Nordstrom and they'd see along with the, the jewelry and the handbags and see a game. Because back then, the only time you ever saw a game is when it was a birthday or the holidays. So now we are alternative distribution in all these different places. Picture is top of mind to people that normally wouldn't see it. And that really, really propelled our growth, getting in front of them. The, uh, the other thing we used to do, we were, we were, there was no manual. Let's put it that way on how to do this. So some people say you've got to break the rules. We forgot to ask what the rules were. So we just made our own. We would take the game and go up to a local bar. We'd open it up and we start playing. People go, what are you doing? Hey, come play the game with us. And so they would play and we go, Oh, by the way, 
you can buy it next door at, at Metropolis. So we were we were shameless in getting that pencil in people's hands. <laughs> and so you're growing, but you know, a- again, there seems to be a big gap between the early days and becoming the best selling board game in the world. Uh, how is how is the company growing? Like, what's the evolution look like? Is it still just the three of you? Are things changing? Have you at what point are you able to to quit your day job? <laughs> well, when I when I was let myself on fire when I was working in the restaurant, we used to have flaming coffees, and I spilled one day and almost lit myself on fire. So that was that was the uh, the physical moment I quit. No, we we hustled our butts off in Seattle, and it took off. And so now we have to figure out how to scale the business. Demand is far outstripping our inventory and way outstripping our ability to fund our growth. So we had to license the game. That's the only way we're going we're gonna, to uh, propel ourselves into the big leagues. And so we uh, were approached by Milton Bradley, the biggest board game company in the world. And they came to us with a deal. They wanted a license. And we get to the meeting and they, they go, okay. And they slap down this box on the table. And we look at it and we go, what's that? And they go, well, it's the new Pictionary box we're going to design for you guys. Huh? Yeah, we're going to change the, the graphics and the rules. And we're going to change some of the words. We're going to sell a lot of these. What do you think? Um, no, this is not what our Pictionary is. This is not what we envision. So we finally get a deal on paper. And they give us the biggest royalty rate they've given anybody. I'm 26 years old. I'm, I'm beating, driving that beater car, 500 bucks a month. And I'm ready to sign this deal. But the one thing they wouldn't put in the contract is they wouldn't touch the packaging without our approval. And I look at that. My partners look at that. And that vision was not aligned with our vision of Pictionary. And we didn't sign it. I didn't sign it. All I had to do was sign this piece of paper and my life changes. And because it wasn't in the best interest of me, my partners or Pictionary, we didn't sign it. And we had no plan B. This isn't like we don't sign this. We have to go. We've we've got this other deal. Our other deal, going back to work, slogging it out, playing games in public, whatever we had to do to sample that game. But we were willing to do it. And as Simon Sinek calls it, you know, your just cause. It's when you're willing to sacrifice everything for your cause. Pictionary was our cause. So we were willing to sacrifice that financial gain. And so we went back to work. Okay, okay. There was a couple of days of like, <laughs> what have we done? But uh, it was the right decision. And two weeks later, three weeks later, we get an offer from a joint venture that we never would have gotten had we accepted the first one. We wound up with a bigger royalty rate, all our guarantees, and the guarantee they wouldn't touch the packaging. And that was the genesis. And that was that propelled us into the big leagues uh, very, very quickly. Yeah. And so I'm totally just impressed and kind of dismayed. And, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you've worked so hard and you have this opportunity and I get principles and I get values, but to leave a deal on the table, what, what were you all thinking? Were you thinking like, look, we're happy with this being small and what smaller and what it is and us not, you know, having a life, our own lives, our own livelihood built off of the, these efforts? Or did you just have faith that you knew that there'd be another deal coming down, you know, into the deal flow? We had no idea. No, we, we weren't, we weren't happy the way it was because we could see we had this, this game that was resonating was going to go huge. And the fact we couldn't do it on our own was frustrating. I mean, it wasn't like, okay, you know, let's, let's just see what happens. It was like, crap, let's make it happen. Let's keep working hard. Let's find another deal. So we, we didn't just sit back. And it wasn't us saying, let's keep it small and, and keep control. It was us saying, this is the wrong deal. And so we waited for something else to come along. But if it didn't, we would have been okay. We, we were willing to uh, roll the dice. So no, it was, it was clear we needed a deal. But it uh, it just didn't present itself for a little while. What was so awful about the packaging? <laughs> you know, you know, I'm, I, you know, there's certain memories that you have in your business life. This is one of the top four or five from Pictionary. 
They slap it on the table. We dubbed it the eye chart. It had two problems with it. One, it was back then the trigger pursuit boxes, which were square and had a four-fold bolt, four-fold board. That's what they presented. Pictionary, the original version, was a long blue box that looked like a long shoe box. That was unique. We had to keep that uniqueness. And two, it looked like an eye chart. It was, all, it was black and white, and it had swirls, and you could barely read the name Pictionary. Uh, they, they, uh, it, it, they dumbed it down. We wanted Pictionary to be on somebody's counter, and play it, and see it all the time. This was just ridiculous. It was just bad packaging. <laughs> well, it sounds like you all made the right decision. So you have a licensing partner uh, that they come in. They they start to give you the capital that you need to to grow and breathe, and and what does that run look like for for you and the team? That looked amazing. Let me. I want to back up just a quick quick side story about the original Pictionary box. It was a long blue box, which uh, we loved and thought it was great, but we didn't design the box and then everything in between in in the packaging. We didn't want to be like everybody else. We wanted to differentiate ourselves and everybody was doing a fourfold. So we wanted something different. So we're talking about it and we're yelling at each other in a very collaborative way. And finally, I get overwhelmed. I go, I, I, I'm, I'm not feeling anything. So I go and sit at a desk by myself. I call it taking a time. Out. I was just taking a break. There happened to be a picture, uh, excuse me, a piece of paper on the desk in front of me. I'm not thinking about the board design or anything else, but I pick it up and all of a sudden it folds on itself, right? Folds into thirds. And I look at this thing and I go, holy moly, that's our new board. That's our differentiation. So we designed the packaging around that board, but it never would have happened had I not taken that time out and just stopped thinking about the problem. And that's really a point of, of my business life is whenever I got overwhelmed, Whenever things weren't going right, I would stop. And then creative juices would start flowing rather than getting frustrated. Just wanted to, just wanted to share that with everybody. No, uh, and I appreciate that. That's a, that's a great piece of insight. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of different things happened because of that. So yeah, so we, 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 we did a licensing agreement with a, a joint venture. And they saw the, the trajectory of Pictionary and so we just started selling the heck out of it all throughout the world. And they turned on the spigot and the public responded. The public responded. And we just started selling millions of games over the next five years within the United States and an equal amount in Europe. And what are you doing? What's your role with the company at this time? My partners and I were unique in that normally when a license happens, the licensors, they just walk away. But we started working harder. We didn't want anybody in charge of our futures. So we didn't want them riding off into the sunset and doing what they wanted with Pictionary. So we made sure to stay involved. We're coming up with new board games. We're coming up with new words, new packaging, whatever was required to make Pictionary a success and keep it a success. We were there. And we would do things like when a new company would come on board in France, for instance, two of us would get on a plane fly over, tell them, what, tell them what worked, what didn't work. You know, we supported them because we wanted them to be successful rather than just hoping they were successful. So we stayed very actively involved. And so the company's doing well. I imagine uh, the original founders are making a good living at this point from the board game. You're not waiting tables, as you mentioned, and doing some other things. And so the game continues to rise and you continue to do well. And Again, is, is there any moment during this period we think where you get in trouble or things just get sideways? Yeah, it was 1987. We were already selling millions of games. And Win, Loser, Draw comes out, the television show, and they launch their board game as well. And for whatever reason, I thought they were going to wipe us off the mat. They have this television show and it's a half hour commercial every day. And I'm thinking, we don't have a chance. It's Burt Reynolds, it's celebrities, it's all these things. And my mind just couldn't get around it. And I started to panic. And here we are, the biggest selling game in the country, but I still had my doubts. And a beautiful thing happened. People start, didn't know the difference between win, lose, or draw. 
and Pictionary. Because we were so firmly established, people thought it was Pictionary with another name. Our sales increased, not decreased. So it had a very positive influence on us where I, originally I thought we were doomed. Well, and that's, that's a piece of good fortune. So you ride yeah. that wave. <laughs> you ride oh, that wave. Yeah, thanks totally. to Bert. Yeah. And one thing we used to do is when the, when the show came out, uh, we would advertise Pictionary on either end of it. So before or after, there'd be a Pictionary TV commercial. <laughs> People would really emphasize that that drawing was Pictionary. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> and so uh, you, you make it through that that phase and um, you, you keep growing the business and you keep growing the business. And, and eventually you come to an exit. Yeah, we did. Uh, it, it was time. It was 17 years from when we launched in uh, 1985. I was about 43 by now. And I'd been with the product and the business for 17 years, 16 years. And I'll just be honest with you. You know, I I developed other priorities. I'd gotten married. I had some kids. And my, my passion had faded. And so it was time for me to go in a different direction. And my partners felt the same way. They were ready to move on with their lives as well. Yeah. And so in 2001, you make a deal to sell the, the business to Mattel. Like, how did that feel? Was that hard? You know, it, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't. I mean, you can hear me just kind of stammering a little bit because it was so powerful that when it was going on, it, it absolutely, at that moment in my life and in time, was the right decision, was the right thing to do because I really didn't feel I wanted to sell. But after being with my partners and, and this game and this life for all that time, it was tough. I mean, after, after the sale, it was like losing a limb, as I call it. I was, I was kind of a little wobbly trying to find my way again. So I took a little time off, which turned into several years. But at first, it was hard to refine my way. The family was great. Everything was good. Uh, but a little piece of me was gone. Yeah, I imagine it was really hard. I mean, you had not only built a business, you had not only realized your dream, you did it in a way where Pictionary became the best-selling board game in the world. So not only like are you achieving all these goals, but you're like kind of the king of your category. I mean, that's pretty awesome, pretty rare. Not a lot of people make it that far. And then you're not doing it anymore. So so what yeah. did you do? <laughs> I, I like that king of the category. I'm going to use that. That was pretty good. Um, I, I decided to basically go back to my roots. So I talked about uh, the bus and talked about being freedom and being in charge of my life. And I went back to that. I continued with that rather than doing what everybody kept saying I needed to do. Rob, you've got to find a new business. You've got to find a new passion. You've got to start a job and be an entrepreneur all over again. No, I don't. That's your vision of what I should be doing. For me, I want to wake up and take my kids to school. I want to mentor people. I want to be involved in nonprofits. I want to enjoy my life how I want to enjoy it. So I was plenty busy, but I didn't feel the need to start a new business. I kept my freedom while giving back and, and uh, as you say, being of service to other people. And for me, it worked out really well. And it, and it, gave, me, uh, it gave me purpose. Yeah. And so what does life look like for you today? <laughs> I'm, I am uh, back to that again. Uh, I've just finished, as you've referenced, a, a book on the Pictionary experience called Game Changer. And it was a fascinating process to write the book over five years, remembering all these stories. And now I am, you know, marketing and promoting it. But it's, it's more just trying to get my story out of how, you know, a 23-year-old waiter from Spokane, Washington, had a dream, had an idea, had a vision, and how I, I got started with, with no plan. I, I didn't know what I was doing half the time, but it worked out. I made it work. And it's just, it's just a great story, I think, for anybody that, that has an idea or just wants to be inspired to try something new or just likes Pictionary and want to know what happened. And so it's, uh, it's been a really, really fun process. Yeah, and we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes so that all our listeners have access to the book and, and know where to find that. 
Rob, as we wind down our time here together, if the 20 year old self, your 20 year old self ran into you today, what do you think he'd say? <laughs> you know, I think he'd say, you know, well done. One thing that's always been important to me is to be me, to be authentic, be true to who I am. And I try not to buy into other people's vision uh, of what I should be or shouldn't be. And I think I've managed to do that. So I think the 20 year old Rob felt the same way. And I think he'd be pleased with who he met. And that is Rob Angel. I loved his idea of finding your aardvark, getting started and never looking back. I also appreciate his experience on taking a time out when struggling with a problem. It seems as though the answer you're looking for never comes when you're trying so hard. And so often the breakthrough happens when you stop and take a time out. I'll try to do that myself the next time I'm struggling to find a solution. Thank you again to Rob Angel. Rob's book can be found at Amazon by searching for Game Changer Rob Angel, and you can connect with him on social media, on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at the Rob Angel. Apparently, the person with Rob Angel is a hairdresser, in case you need that too. We'll make sure to link to all those resources in the show notes. Well, that's the show. Until next time. Make sure to visit our website, www.wildstory.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. A lot of big stories and I cannot lie, you other storytellers can't deny. 